Um, so let's talk about um, the Sverdrup field first. Production's been ramping up quickly. I'm wondering if you're still on track to reach that more than 300,000 barrel per day capacity by the end of November, like you said last month, or if in fact it could be even higher now. What's your guidance? No, our eight wells uh, that we have pre-drilled will be uh, producing uh, during November uh, and uh, having then a well potential uh, above 300,000 barrels a day. Mm -hmm. uh, we need another two to four wells to be drilled uh, to reach plateau, which we expect to happen uh, during summer next year, yeah. and then reach 440,000 barrels a day. And let me remind you, this is barrels which will have a unit production cost below $2 per barrel. Uh, produced uh, and a cash margin next year of $50 after tax uh, at an oil price of 70 Right. Um, you talked about um, summer next year for the plateau. Um, I believe you're thinking about that sort of max phase one uh, capacity of 440,000 barrels uh, per day. Could you actually reach the level earlier than the summer? Because some analysts and observers and indeed shareholders are kind of expecting that. Well, uh, our plan is, uh, you know, we need two to four wells. We don't know how many. Um, mm -hmm. If you only need two, then we will do it uh, sooner, kind of. If uh, everything, uh, you know, adds up to it, it might happen. But this is our current plan and our best estimate. Okay. We hope too, like everybody else, that we would reach it sooner. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, if we talk about um, the outlook then as well uh, for oil demand, I mean, it's been a conversation that's been around for a while, peak oil demand. Mm -hmm. And we hear from the IEA that global oil demand is going to hit a plateau around 2030. Does that mm -hmm. line up with your expectations as well? Yeah, we see a peak uh, demand uh, during the uh, next decade, late next decade. Hmm. Mm -hmm. And you've said before that there is a chance that it might happen even earlier. Um, how are you sort of preparing for that if, if you do have a, a, a case that we could get peak oil demand even earlier than 2030? Well, one thing is uh, peak demand. I think uh, what the industry is looking at is how much oil we need to deliver uh, yes. to, to uh, supply uh, whatever kind of demand you, you predict, whether that is peak demand uh, during 2020 or 2030. Um, even in the most uh, sort of energy transition optimistic scenario, mm -hmm. uh, if you look at 2050, this industry needs to put in production new capacity of 300 billion barrels to be produced over that period of time. So it's a lot of oil and gas that need to be discovered, developed and put in production to even deliver on the most uh, pessimistic kind of uh, oil demand outlook. Right. And then if we talk about energy transition as well, I mean, of course, you've stepped up your game in uh, in offshore wind and you've already said that it's ahead of schedule, that you're ahead of schedule on your target to invest about 100 billion kroner, that's 11 billion dollars in new energy solutions by 2030. You're going to push that category to 15 to 20 percent of total capex by the same date. Should we assume that you're likely to exceed those targets in 2030? Well, I think we have had very good industrial uh, development uh, this year with in our renewable uh, space. Um, one uh, Arcona asset that we put in production early this year in Germany. We have had good uh, progress in the Empire Wind Project offshore uh, Manhattan in New York. Mm -hmm. And then we won the Dogger development in UK, uh, 3.6 gigawatt to be installed. Um, and uh, you could argue that uh, with this project, uh, we will reach the 15 to 20 percent uh, capex uh, ambition um, uh, sooner than 2030. OK, sooner than 2030. Mm -hmm. And can you just give us a little bit more um, precise detail on the funding of the projects? How much are you actually likely to put on the table in terms of investments? Well, just for the Dogger project, uh, yeah. all three projects totaling 3.6 gigawatt, we are talking about 9 billion mm -hmm. uh, British pounds. So it's a substantial big project. And I think these uh, projects placed our strength. This is a uh, big project. Dogger is 300 windmills. So it's an assembly line of many wind windmills to be installed. So you get kind of learning, you get technology development. So this is uh, an asset that we really, really believe in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if we look at U.S. shale as well, I mean, going back to the um, IEA report, one thing that they talked about was that the U.S. will account for 85 percent of growth in production worldwide to 2030. Um, in terms of U.S. shale, you agreed to sell the Eagle Ford U.S. shale asset to Repsol last week. Should we expect more impairments on your other U.S. shale assets, uh, Beckon and Marcellus? Well, these assets, um, different from many other assets that we have in our portfolio, have been acquired and thereby you have kind of a higher book to, uh, value as a starting point. Uh, so when you have volatility in the prices, you reach that, uh, that threshold and the prices goes down sooner than for many other assets. So that's why we have had uh, impairments and reversal of impairments in our onshore U.S. business. 
Um, so there's no indication uh, as to sort of further impairments, but uh, the price uh, development uh, will uh, have an impact on that. Yeah. Forward. Finally, Lars, I mean, there's been um, some reports in Norwegian newspapers that Equinor has started the search for the successor of CEO Elder Setra. Would you be willing to take that post or at the very least, do you think the candidate should be an internal one? Do you know what? Uh, we read uh, articles like this from time to time. I was told about this article uh, during the weekend and uh, Eldar Setre is our CEO. Uh, I took on the role as a CFO of August 1st last year and that yeah. is uh, what I'm focusing on. Okay, but should mm -hmm. the next candidate be internal? Well, that's up for the board to decide.